So I think I was introduced, so I don't, I, but I'm Robert Krolwich from National Public Radio and from Radio Lab. <laughs> Uh, I should warn you in advance that what I know about mathematics, higher mathematics, is very, very little, which is the excitement to me about trying to do this. This is for me would be a, is trapeze work. So, um, let me introduce the guests. Uh, first, known as the Math Guy on National Public Radio, he is the author of 30 books and over 80 published research articles. Keith Devlin is a recognized mathematician a recognized mathematician, which I guess means that he's really a plumber and looks like a mathematician, or I don't know, and a, a researcher at Stanford University, and here is Keith. And next, Jonathan Borwain is a mathematics professor at the University of Newcastle in Australia. He's the director of the Center for Computer Assisted Research Mathematics and its Applications. You kind of know when they do that, there's got to be some acronym. It's called KARMA. So uh, he's a noted expert on the number pi and a leading thinker in the field of experimental mathematics. So here is Jonathan. Next, Marcus de Sotoy, a professor of mathematics at the University of Oxford, a mathematician, a researcher, occasionally on Radio Lab. He studies prime numbers and symmetry. Marcus. And finally, a science journalist, producer with a PhD in particle physics. Simon Singh's documentary about Fermat's last theorem was nominated for an Emmy. His publication on the same subject, Fermat's Enigma, was the first book about mathematics to become the number one bestseller in the UK. So here is Simon. Well, <clears throat> let's see how to start this. First of all, the, since the question posed is what is mathematics, there's, uh, you know, I just, I don't know, way of describing nature, art form, language, brain's way of seeing the world, exploration, competitive sport, God's mind revealed. Uh, let's start with a, with a pattern sense. W when you were a kid, did you take an unusually long gazes at pineapple surfaces or <laughs> uh, sunflower? No, it took me a long while, actually, to get into maths. I didn't, uh, oh. uh, or, or math, as you call it here. Yes, we keep um, it singular. Yeah, I don't know why. It's, I think it's a very plural subject. But, we call uh, it mathematics. Uh, but we're, yeah, no, well, maybe yeah. mathematics is a better way to... Yeah. Um, but it was around, uh, you know, because I think the real distinction here is that uh, early on in your career, you're doing, dealing with numeracy and arithmetic, and that's not what mathematics is about. And I think for many people, that's the misconception. They think it's, they say they're bad at maths, but actually they may be bad at numeracy. Most mathematicians are bad at arithmetic. Um, uh, and actually, maths is about pattern searching. It's, right. And it's what we've been evolutionary programmed to do. You know, we've survived in this world because we're very good at spotting patterns. Um, in the jungle, if you see something with a bit of symmetry, it's likely to be uh, an animal, which either you could eat or it might eat you. So it's good to recognize symmetry. But um, when you were seven, like, did you go to the, out into the garden and say, one ant, two ant, four no, ant? No, no, no. I was actually much more interested in languages. Um, I, I, I wanted to become a spy and uh, be in the foreign office. Um, and it was only when I started <laughs> to realize that mathematics is actually, actually, I, I hated languages because they're all these irregular verbs and strange spellings. And it was when I suddenly realized mathematics is a fantastic language. It has no exceptions, got lots of surprises, but it's got no irregular verbs. And it's a fantastic language for describing the world around you. And I think it was about 12, 13 that I started to get a little bit nerdier and start to spot spirals in pineapples. But and that did like that. happen? Finally? Yeah, it did. And yeah. I, I now can't look at a pineapple without going, oh, eight, 13. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and you? Did, did, when, just, did you oh. happen to be uh, pattern sensitive? Not at all. No, I. I the year before I went to high school back in England was the year the Russians put Sputnik in. I wanted to go into the space race. I mean, it was just space exploration. I wanted to do physics. And so I'd started learning mathematics in order to become a good physicist. And I didn't like mathematics until I was 16 and I met calculus. Anyone who's read the blog I put up on the, on the World Science Festival blog, I put a blog up about why I became a mathematician. The very moment where all my classmates got turned off, calculus, that turned me on. It, first of all, it was obviously was going, well, it was obviously important for getting rockets into space and getting yeah. them back again. 
But it was also very powerful, and I couldn't understand it. It's the first thing ah. you meet at school that you actually can't understand if you put your mind to it. It baffled me. It was clear that there was a mystery. I mean, we're talking about this was a mystery that you felt personally you wanted to solve. Oh, I, I couldn't stand. You know, I was the kind of kid that used to take the automobiles apart. I wanted to see how things worked. Yeah. And here was this calculus that was invented by a guy who was age 22 because the college was closed. You know, he was going to go to Isaac Newton, was going to Cambridge. There was the plague. What, are you a Newton fan? Or, and, okay. And, and, oh, you know, yeah. What would you do if the college was closed? You'd probably go and have a good time and go to the beach. Isaac Newton invents calculus. So you've got this 22-year-old invents calculus. It's powerful. I could use it. I could do all the problems and get them right. I had no idea why it worked. And I wanted to take the hood so off that's, I mean, and figure like, it out. So that's, that's maybe... So when you played sports, did you think, OK, if I stand here, the arc of the Lord, the declining arc of the Lord, <laughs> I think, or, or were you odd? Or were you what I would call <laughs> ordinary? Uh, no, I was never enough of a sportsman to do anything except say, I wish it goes somewhere else. <laughs> Please okay. let somebody else catch it. Um, <laughs> my, uh, my father is quite a distinguished mathematician. He's been uh, president of the Canadian Mathematical Society, and I think he's now the sixth oldest member of the London Mathematical Society in his the late sixth 80s. sixth oldest? Well, they keep a list. It's a little bit macabre. Well, because it's the Mathematics Society, you well, figure. Well, indeed. Yeah. indeed. And you can, win a prize. Five, right. you can win a prize, but only once for being the oldest person at an American Math Society banquet. Really? You can't keep doing it for obvious reasons. <laughs> well, anyway, you can't. You know, they have annual banquets, and you're they like. They do. They do. So but in, and to get back to your central. No, wait, wait. Why, if you're 93, can't you make it to your 94th? Because they want to give somebody else younger a chance. Oh, so you're not and invited to the banquet? You can come, but you can't win the prize again. I see, okay. <laughs> and, and since the oldest uh, uh, Viennese, uh, um, Austrian mathematician some years ago was Via Torres, who was also the oldest Austrian and died about age 108. You can see that you wouldn't want to give this prize out only once every 20 years. <laughs> but getting back to your central question, I also didn't There's want such to... such strange envy. So these people in Britain are going to this dinner envying the Australian who's two years older than <laughs> I don't Well, know. people do lie about their age in the opposite direction after all, right? Yeah, I didn't they know They try that. to say they're older. Yeah. Um, I, I, since my dad was a mathematician, he taught me a few pieces of math to, pr to win bets with faculty in St. Andrews. So, he taught me to solve two by two simultaneous equations when I was six. I well, no when would you have a bet like that uh, when you're six? Well, because he won five with pounds. Whom? He won five pounds of cheese and a five pound note, which was quite a lot in the fifties. No, he did. But if you if you're a six year old, using whatever you just said yeah. in a betting situation <laughs> with six year olds, I don't see how that would be an occasion that would ever come up. Well, I suppose I must have liked the pattern because I had no idea what I was doing. But after that, I went to university to study history, huh? and I got as far in the days of punch cards for registration of being about to drop my cards in second year into a history box. And I thought, if I do this in 10 years' time, I won't be able to integrate anything or work out the equations of motion. But if I go back and find the math cards, in five years' time, I can still read about the Treaty of Vienna. And I did, and it's turned out to be the truest decision I ever made. So I can tell you the day I became a mathematician. But I came to it a bit like it sounds like you, out of the arts, not out of the sciences directly. Well, so, so then what is it exactly? Is it, is it an instinct that humans are born with? I mean, there are, there are people in the Amazon who have one and two and three, but they don't have four, five, or six, or seven. And they do perfectly well. I mean, they seem to know the difference between more and less. I don't know what they do. If I had three fish and you had two apples and I wanted to raise the price of fish, I don't know how that conversation would go. But do you think it's an instinct in us? I don't know, you. I don't think it's an instinct in, in the way that we think about math today, when we think about numbers and precision. Um, you can do experiments, I think there's an experiment with a raven, where a raven uh, was uh, on the top of a, a tower, and uh, a hunter would approach the tower, and the raven would disappear. And the raven uh, would, would disappear until the hunter had left the tower and gone away again. And then the, the, the hunters thought, well, how clever is this raven? So then two hunters would go in the tower. Raven would disappear. One hunter would leave, but the, cro the raven wouldn't return until the second hunter had left. So, so the raven um, could somehow count. But if five hunters went in and four came out, then the raven couldn't differentiate between five and four. It would come back and get shot by the remaining hunter. So, so it, it's as though 
it's so own, an approximate. Yeah, it's as though hunters were like uh, tablespoons of, of sugar. And I can differentiate between two spoonfuls of sugar and one spoonful of sugar in a pile, but I can't really differentiate between five and four. So unless we can begin to put symbols or words to numbers, then it's only then I, I think that we can begin to really manipulate them. I, I should just stress, see, I, I, of the people here on the panel, I, uh, like everybody here, I didn't really like maths as a child. And I didn't really you like it as an right? adult either. No, I, <laughs> <laughs> really? I, no, I mean, I became, uh, like, um, like, like Keith, I was interested in science. I think it's a very obvious desire to want to understand the universe, to understand where the universe came from, what stuff's made of, where life came from. This is really obvious stuff to be interested in. Yeah. I think nearly all children are interested in that. And then gradually, we, we maybe lose that curiosity. Um, but to be interested in math is a bit odd. And, and, and I think that's why, why people are sometimes scared of math or don't understand why math is a passion. I only became interested in math because then, as, as a scientist, I became a science journalist. As a science journalist, I ended up writing about maths. And I'd always seen maths as something you have in order to do science. But I think that's how, it's, yeah. that's how it started, of yeah. course, you know, uh, in order to navigate the world, um, to measure land areas, to tax them, yeah. to build new buildings, you find, or to answer these big yeah. questions uh, of science, you find that maths is the best language. But, and then it starts to take on a life of its own, and you start to get interested in it for, in its, for, for its own sake, and the, the properties of numbers and, and the well, patterns uh, there. But is, so. it, is it a measuring thing? Like, if, if, if a girls were going to jump rope, so it's just basically... Well, you know, and they, go, and they have those patterns. Like, doop -a -doop -a -doop -a -doop -a -doop -a oh, I'm not a girl, so I don't know. But uh, I don't know why I say things like that. Um, <laughs> but it, isn't, isn't singing, dancing, and playing games sort of playing with segments of time a lot? And so isn't that math? Sort yeah, of? So, so mathematics really changed. The, 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 the elementary parts of mathematics, the stuff that everyone would have had in school, that does come out of the world. It's sort of formalizing ways of thinking that we used to survive and have done for the history of humankind. But then the, the moment when I got into it at calculus, it sort of flips. It becomes largely something we invent and create ourselves, becomes very abstract. It's still actually useful, but it doesn't. I mean, in calculus, you're talking about infinitesimals. There are no infinitesimals in the world. We invent them in part to understand the world, but those of us that are in mathematics play with them because they're fun to play with. Uh, yeah, they really are. <laughs> <laughs> Trust me. Well, the, the audience probably knows it's certainly what the encyclopedists thought, that uh, while French was a perfectly good language for science, only German was really set for emotion and love. <laughs> uh, these are things that people think about other languages, but the reason I bring it up is that what has kept me attracted to mathematics, it's two things. It's all of what Keith said, this wonderful set of tools, unreasonably efficacious tools, uh, for making more progress often than seems reasonable, but at the same time, it's a language in which you can express things you didn't know you wanted to express until you could speak some of the language. So the language is called numbers, I guess. The language is called num mathematics. Math numbers are some numbers. of the words. Because I, I do, I remember reading somewhere that a baby born on the first day, if you stood in front of them on the first day of its life, and you went beep, beep, mm -hmm. beep, 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 for a very long time, no. and then you changed, oh, it's three. Only up to three. Mm. Yeah, and if you change the number, the yeah. baby startles or yeah. looks more closely. So there, there's some sense of, of pattern anyway. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But now, the, the number... Um, do we have any idea when that was invented or where that comes from, how old it is? Well, yes, yes, it's interesting. You can even do some fairly robust kind of cladistics, and you'll discover that the number two is older than the number one in terms of where it's shared in the tree of language. Really? Yeah, so, you, you know, it's all conjectural. That's the lovely yeah. thing about uh, archaeology and paleo whatever. You're never going to be proved wrong, but it seems pretty plausible <laughs> that we... Well, that's a good thing, isn't it? Uh, well, but, but you see these very ancient bones, the, like the Ashango bone, yes. which are, is, is tens of thousands of years old, with notches, yes. you know, people keeping track of things and wanting to know how many... I mean, it's not quite clear what it's keeping track of, whether it's um, uh, perhaps a calendar or something, but, you know, I, I think, uh, you know, navigating... Seeing patterns in the stars is probably where, you know, you start to get ma the mathematical mind working, the fact that things repeat themselves, and if they repeat themselves, then you can make predictions about the future, and that this language gives you incredible incredible power and, and you know you see that you could predict a flood or an eclipse 
Yeah. yeah. When the, the, the flooding of the Nile, they power. spotted patterns to this, and that 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 And, 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 and then once, once you've like had the flooding of the Nile, not only do you want to be, not only do you want to be able to predict the flooding of the Nile, you then want to be able to, to rebuild your fields afterwards. You need to have measurement and and geometry to be able to do this. So it's a purely functional, useful tool that, that societies need. If we're going to trade, if we're going to send ships, we're going to. Plot, and if we're going to be interested in astrology, we need mathematics. But the, the, the really interesting transition, and I think what was interesting about the little video clip we had at the beginning, was a lot of that was applied mathematics. And it's verging on the science. And we kind of all understand why science is, is interesting, useful, and important. But, but the really weird transition, I'm not sure when this happens, this is maybe going back two and a half thousand years, is people who begin to study numbers purely for the hell of it, for the fun of it, for the surprisingness. The fact that there's this thing called a perfect number, six. Uh, one plus two plus three is six, and one and two and three are the only numbers that go into six. And 28 is uh, one, four, seven, and 14. Am I missing and one? Two. And two. two. <laughs> Add up to 28, and it <laughs> divides into 28. But then, I don't know where the next one is up in the hundreds, isn't it? 496. So, yeah, so, so, so per... <laughs> So now, do you think that these people, you. do you think these people sort of, uh, did you have to get, because I'm actually wondering whether you get notches first or maybe circles, do you think circles or lines precede numbers or circles, yeah, well, lines or triangles? Well, numbers, the geometry? abstract numbers are incredibly recent, mm. about 10,000 years ago most, and it was essentially money in Sumeria. Sumerian society reached a stage of complexity where the trading was obviously much better if it was mediated by something and basically, if you want to know where numbers do, it's like following political careers. Find where the money comes from. That's where the numbers came from. <laughs> Nothing new in the world, especially and, and, and geometry as well. I mean, you see in, in the uh, Rhine Papyrus, you see a formula for the volume of a pyramid and beautifully proved as well using sort of an early form of the calculus. Well, of course, that, that was a practical need to know, you know, how many stones are we going to have in this pyramid? But, but then you see a sort of abstract love of the mathematics and the game yeah. starting to come in. And it takes on a, a sort of power of its own. And I you think that's right. These perfect numbers yeah. are, are perfectly useless. It's perfectly but, uh, pointless, perfectly useful. Yeah. But you kind of think, oh, that's kind of cool. These are... Well. Uh, so and where are the other Are you ones? imagining that this is because you're sort of like that? Like, you like, is this like a, a prayer that you're telling us here, or is this history that you could? I mean, I'm, we're not going to no, meet Mr. This, Caveman. This is who, history, and I think it's interesting to ask how much of it is uh, contingent and how much of it was necessary. So, for example, it, usual accounting would be that the Greeks, the, class, the classic Greeks, brought us the sense of trying to build a deductive system, being interested in the properties of numbers right. uh, for their own right or mixed with ideas of harmony and religion. Uh, but imagine, and I, I've just been doing some work with my colleague David Bailey at uh, Lawrence Berkeley Labs, and I was flabbergasted to discover 13 decimal accuracy square roots in very old Indian documents, pre-Christian. Uh, um, hmm. So sophisticated that you wonder what would have happened if those techniques had made it to the West through Spain mm. in 700 AD, not in 1400 AD. And for some reason, all of the manuscripts that we learned about Aristotle or Pythagoras had actually got burnt. And so what we had inherited was a very much more functional set of how to do things. Is it necessary that we would have later said we need theory? Mm -hmm. I'm well, not but, so but, sure. But Keith is positing the, the, that the first guy was just a businessman on the fast track, mm -hmm. and he just got himself the first attaché case or something. Right. The other way to think of it would be that the first mathematician was sort of an artist, like you would think, maybe. Like well, he just I, wanted I, to play. But, but I think imagine. math goes back so, so far in time that we had to feed ourselves, we had to keep warm, we had to fight off bears and wolves, and and math evolved in that environment where you desperately needed to survive. Oh. And and I, and it's the same with science. Wait, you know, I thought you, you were the artist guy. I thought you were trying to imagine this. Uh, Fellow who was playing. Oh, yeah, but there, there's a, there's a, yeah, but I, but I think math starts off as being functional. Science starts off. Science doesn't start off. You have technology, and then people start realizing if they want to build technology, it's actually quite useful to understand some of the basic science. So, so the purer side emerges only much later. The great um, <coughs> Canadian geometer Coxeter was a friend of Escher's, the Dutch artist who most people who come to these sort of things, I think, probably likes. Um, and um, <laughs> late in his life, Co Coxer lived a very long life, lived to age 97 and gave lectures till about age 96. Um, good lectures. He um, wrote a paper, maybe one of his very last papers, and he's explaining one of Escher's 
uh, continuing Drawing. constructions, and he said, Escher did this as art. I had to use trigonometry. Huh. So I, I think but there are, there are artsy yeah. phrases that you associate. There are things like elegant proofs and ugly proofs, mm. words like that. I, the way it, it feels to me a little bit is that, is that art is just freer. It, it, that, that real art means if you paint a painting, you're not constrained. You can no, paint I, but I, most artists will disagree with you and say that their best creative art, art is done under huge constraints. I mean, Stravinsky used to say that he was only creative when he put constraints on himself. So I think if you have too much freedom, very often you, you become uncreative. And mathematics is an incredibly creative subject. We're making a lot of choices in the sort of things we want to celebrate as theorems I'll talk about in a seminar or write up in a... Uh, in a paper. I mean, I, I study the world of symmetry. I can get a computer just to generate arbitrary new symmetrical objects. Um, what's interesting is to choose the ones which have something special about them. And it's just the same. You can get a computer to churn out music, but you make a choice as a composer. And I think there's an incredibly creative side to, well, wh why is this exciting? There's an ex exciting connection with another bit of mathematics which is totally unexpected, and this is why I want to tell you this story. So I think there is a lot of choice one, in mathematics. One, one nice description of, of the aesthetic response is the perception of order in what seems first to be chaotic. Yeah. And again, that calls on whether it's a fugue or a structured piece of poetry to have that underlying structure and that to some degree the aesthetic response, the aha, equivalent to an aha mathematically, is where you say, oh, okay, it does make sense. It's not just jangles. Yeah, but here's the difference. If, if we all agree that this will be the number three, yes. let's all agree, and we all agree that this symbol will mean we're going to add something. Yeah. Once we've agreed on those terms, Three means a triplet, triplet yeah. of some sort, and plus means. Then if you, then if I say three plus three equals, it, at that point it has to be six. That's not the case for Shakespeare. Hamlet could have killed his father any time Bill Shakespeare yeah, but wanted. That, but, but you're, you're comparing two things which are not alike. It's like talking about English grammar. This, this word is spelt like this in the human only. But the, you know, mathematics is not about spelling and grammar. It's about the big stories. Um, the stories and of these prime are numbers, of symmetry. Yeah. These are the things that we, the stories we choose to celebrate. And, and they have a truth about them. You can't change them. They're, so it, it feels like there's more constraints on mathematics. But still, the stories we choose to tell are it, as exciting and have the drama. And we we choose to tell those stories because they have the same effect on us as a piece of Shakespeare. You're but, just comparing two wrong things then. No, not exactly, because <laughs> uh, I feel no, if I, I wanted spell? to have like the Chinese menu of all time, I know that as soon as I got three plus three, I don't, I, I'm not allowed to turn it into seven. No, but but that, if that, I'm you're, Picasso, you're, no, no, but exactly. But if you've but, got Hamlet, you'll say, well, I'm going to spell it H-A-M-L-E-T. And then if you have it later on in the play and you misspell it, it's sort of, uh, that's uninteresting. But, but that's not what Shakespeare is about. Uh, mathematics uh, isn't about but, three plus three plus We're all going to be very, very aggressive. But you're outnumbered here. With very elementary maths. Well, you do? It's dull, it's dry, it's ugly, it's tedious just like very ugly, prosaic English. The, the jump you have with the spoken word is from the spoken functional word to poetry. And suddenly you say, wow, that's, that's beautiful, that, that, that's something I want, I want to embrace, that's something I want to play with, I want to uh, create surprises, I want to make people laugh. And, and with math, again, you have these very mundane, prosaic numbers. And you ask very basic questions like multiplication, square roots, and, uh, and you say, well, what happens if I take away three from six? Well, that's Three, that's pretty obvious. What about if I take away six from three? Hey, that's mind-blowing. The first person asked that question suddenly has to invent the idea of negative numbers. And this, this I can't hold negative three pebbles. This is, that's mind-blowing. And then you start saying, well, okay, square root of nine is three, but what about the square root of negative three? What does that mean? And that becomes curious and odd. And then you say, well, okay, let's allow that to be a number, and we'll call that uh, root three i. Is that right? Good, thank you. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, um, I'm just what, thinking, what? listening to this, like, is that, I don't want to push this too hard. I think you guys are of the, you, you, you'll say one, an odd number, plus one, another odd number, <gasps> makes an even number. And right. that, like, shocks you, and, and it's like storytelling in a way. <laughs> it, it, doesn't, it doesn't shock me, and, and you're at the heart. Or you of, find it beautiful. You're or, at the heart of something really complicated, but I could say all of computer science really originated when George Gould said, no, one plus one doesn't equal two, it equals zero. Yeah. Who said that? George Gould. Yeah. When you go back to the basis of the idea that you might be adding in what's called clock notation or 
binary, and the effect of two ones is a zero. And that gives you the whole idea of modern modular arithmetic, what are called finite fields and on. And so where the creativity in math comes is to say, not that it was wrong to say one plus one equals two, but there may be interesting ways of abstracting this where it's better to think of it as being something else. And so, again, we don't try and say, if you've got a dictionary, you can write Shakespeare. Right. We do try to say, if you've learned the language, you probably appreciate some of the Shakespeare. Well, let me switch the question a little bit. Let me, why are some people better at this than others? Is this, um, is this a talent? Is it genetic? Is it just a language with different degrees yeah, of difficulty? I think or what? In interest. It's just interest. Just interest. If you're interested, you'll become good at it, and you do it. I mean, the two of these guys didn't even begin in mathematics. I didn't begin. I began in physics, and not mathematics. And one is denying his evidence. Like that. <laughs> but we all enjoy it, and we appreciate it. Yeah. And it's just a matter of interest. That, that but I, I think there is, a, there, is a, there is a reason why mathematics um, people do seem to be sometimes bad at it, which is mathematics is a bit like building a pyramid. And each year, you add more to the pyramid. If you have one bad year in your mathematical mm -hmm. education, it's impossible to build anything on it. You're lost from there yeah, on lost. inwards. And that doesn't happen so much in other subjects. You know, if, you, if you've got a bad history teacher um, teaching the Victorians, it doesn't kind of mess you up for the history of the 20th century. You can get back into it. A little bit like you said, um, with your experience of, mm. well, I can uh, reread the history later on, but with the maths, if I miss out. Yeah. So I think that uh, what happens is that you need to have a very consistent um, education because one bad layer and, and it really messes you for the rest of the story. Well, is the key thing when you say it's interest, is it, is it that you're like the problem with math as opposed to some other subjects is that there is a right answer. So, you, you, if you're learning, you know, you're, often. You, it's hard to <laughs> fail. Yeah, often. Yeah. So, so, it's hard to, you, you're just going to fail or succeed. It's sort of binary. And well, that except the, I mean, that's one of its charms, I think, actually. Yeah, there me. are sort of right answers, but that's not what mathematics isn't really about what's right. It's why is something right or wrong. It's and the why do with that's it. of interest. Not whether it's right or wrong. That's a, a, a fallout from the way we often teach it, that it's all about right and wrong. There's a right and wrongness there, just like there's a right and wrong way to spell things. But Shakespeare isn't, so to go back to that example, isn't about how you spell the words. It's, is it a good story and why do people behave the way they do? In mathematics, it's not what's right and what's wrong, but why is this right in, in this circumstance? Well, or then maybe the, the difference is some people make this personal. They say, this is my question. I want to know the answer, or to put it as you did, I'm interested. Oh, yeah. Others of us think, I'll do what the teacher says, and you never somehow get across, so it never becomes yours. Do you know, that's how I passed English literature at school. <laughs> <laughs> I got these cliff notes, and I read them, and I answered the exams, and it took me 10 years to like Shakespeare after I graduated from high school. Pe people oh. don't have to like math. Yeah. People, <laughs> people have a perfect right to hate math, and I, there are many, I hate languages, I'm terrible at languages. Um, but but there, there is a world out there that people may be unaware of. And just coming back to yeah. the, the point Keith made, there's a lovely problem called the four-color map problem. So if you've got a map, and people may remember this from, from school, how many colors do you need to color a map, any imaginable, any conceivable map, so that no two uh, regions have the same color? Right. And for 100 years, people knew that you didn't need more than five. But they weren't sure whether you could get away with four. And, and that's kind of a weird, interesting, odd question. And it's just something that gets you thinking, well, do you need four? Do you need five? Why is it four? Why is it five? How, how would I go about trying to prove it? So it's an odd, quirky, interesting bit of playful maths. Right. And uh, it turned out, I think it was about in the 70s, a couple of American guys, uh, Apple and Harkin, proved it. And they proved it by saying that every map can basically be built from several thousand other constituent maps. And if you can prove that the other thousand or so constituent maps only need four colors, then all maps only need four colors. Now, we now know you only need four colors. But it's not a very satisfying proof. It doesn't really give you any insight. It doesn't make you smile. It doesn't, you know, it, we're not that surprised, because we already kind of knew it was four. So that's an area of math which is, has been curious, odd, and quirky. But I think mathematicians are still waiting for that aha moment. It doesn't have that beauty and elegance that something like um, Euclid's proof. Euclid had a proof about the number of that, primes. That's, that comes to my present passion, which is I, I'm much influenced by people like Greg Chaitin, the complexity theorist. I don't believe that just because something has a, let's use the word, beautiful fact, we don't know if there are infinitely many perfect numbers, those numbers like 1 and 6 and 28. We do know it relates to how many 
primes there are of the form 2 to the n minus 1. Mm -hmm. but, and we don't know if there are any odd perfect numbers. And we haven't known that for 2,500 years. That's a problem that classic Greeks asked. Is there a number like 6, which is the sum of its proper divisors, and is odd? Nobody knows, and nobody has the slightest idea how to prove it. Well, we grew up in a 2,000 years of post-Greek uh, philosophizing about mathematics, which essentially identified truth and provability. Now, we've known for 100 years that's not true. And it's perfectly reasonable in my, now, the way I organize the world to think, that might be true because it's not false. It wouldn't make it unbeautiful, but there's a lot of stuff out there that we should try and work out what we think about it, and, and not everything that's beautiful fact will have a beautiful proof. Not everything that's provable will have a nice proof. And that changes your view of mathematics. But do you hear what you're saying? Like, the, 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 the way you're already in love with the question. What happens in a lot of schools, yep. and particularly in junior high schools and high schools in America, is that people want the answers. The teachers want the answers. But they never ask you to love the question. Right. Well, mm -hmm. I think it's, it so, com comes back to this don't. idea, actually, that it, it, very often when we're teaching maths, we just teach the grammar and the vocabulary. Although it's like learning a musical instrument, where you're only allowed to play scales and arpeggios, and nobody ever plays you a real piece of music. The reason why I fell in love with mathematics is because my maths teacher at my, my school, when I was 13, uh, pulled me out of the maths class at the end of the lesson. I thought I was in trouble. He took me around the back of the maths block. I thought I was really in trouble now. Um, uh, and then he said, you know, so do I think you should find out what maths is really about. And he started telling me about the Fibonacci numbers and about primes and recommended a few books to me. Suddenly I saw what this subject was really about. And I think we, we cheat our kids by, by just saying, oh, it's about scales and arpeggios. But if you get to listen to a piece of Bach or some, some blues, then you say, ah, oh, that's what I want to do. I don't know how to play that yet. I don't know how to compose it. But that's where I'm heading, and that's what I was but lucky enough to But how many teachers are there like that? Not enough. I, when I decided, when I loved calculus and what to do, that's exactly what my teachers did. They took me out of the class and said, here's my college textbooks. Teach yourself. I'll try and remember what it was like to do those and help you out. And it was this, oh. hundred, this incredible world opened up of real mathematics that I didn't know existed. And Simon and I were lucky. I mean, Marcus and I were lucky. Simon wasn't lucky because yeah, he I, didn't I was get in the class and two people got taken out. I was wondering, well, I'm cleaning off the math. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it's, um, but it's, it's a, just a, it's a, the, uh, there are things called uh, non transitive dice. Am I, is it non transitive? Yeah. So, so if I've got a dice and, and it doesn't have one to six on it, um, it's got some odd numbers on it. And I give you a dice uh, and I give Keith a dice. And typically, if you and I roll this, these, our, our own two dices, you typically beat my dice. Whatever these numbers are, your dice generally are going to show a higher number than my dice. And when you play the dice game with Keith, Keith's dice typically beats your dice. And that, that's the way it goes. Your dice is better than my dice. Keith's dice is better than yours. But when I play dice against Keith, my dice beat Keith. That's a really weird thing. It's like saying that one is less than two, two is less than three, but three is less than one. It's a mind-blowing concept. And then the really weird thing is if we double our dice, um, the order reverses. So if you show that to a, a 13, 14-year-old kid who's, who's played with normal arithmetic and multiplication square roots, that's a, a, that, again, that's a mind-blowing world. Well, that's the other thing. That means that you want to make it, uh, you want to attach it to the world. You want to say, if you know this, then you can do that. But too. that might be like playing Mario Brothers. It doesn't have to somehow be like working out the velocity of a bicycle. It could just be letting you do something you wanted to do. Then better. you need to be a scientist. Yeah. That, that's, yeah. I mean, I, there's, there's something like... No, if, no, no, no. Why can't, why can't math classes... I don't know. There's probably a good answer to this. But it, it seems to me that there's the two problems are that the teacher doesn't sort of make it, let you make it personal, doesn't let you fail without punishing you for it, and third, doesn't seem to make it of the world where you live. It's and that's something because... The skills needed to do that, what gets called in educational language, unpacking concepts, are a great deal more sophisticated than the skills that are needed to do fractions. Mm -hmm. If you've just learned enough math and we don't pay and we don't have enough teachers ready to come into the trenches who are secure about their mathematical knowledge, enough that they've actually studied why Anne might have a good idea by me saying it wrong, because they're just trying to stay one step ahead. And it's this massive difference between being able to do the arithmetic or the manipulations and being able to step back and say, ah, oh, I see how that fits in. Here's and you're saying the analogy. teacher doesn't know. They can't have, uh, when we, in most parts of the world, we put teachers in the classroom to teach math who have very little math in their training. Well, let me ask another question, different. Does, does math describe reality, or is math itself out there and, and, and real? 
The answer is yes. <laughs> <laughs> it does both. Well, we are, it's both. It does it both. Well. It's a genus. It looks in both directions, and it legitimately looks in both directions. And that's some of its strength. Well, does that mean that, that math does tell you about the world, but in a more perfect way? Yeah. And that we live in some sort of uh, shadow of perfection? Well, I, I, I'm not even sure that physics tells us about the world. Physics tells us about how the human mind conceives of the world, and Correct. mathematics is part of that. It tells us as much about the human mind as it does about the environment around it, if you want to regard those two things as, as separate entities. It's, a, it, it's like a mirror on the mind. It, what it really does is tell you how the human mind perceives the environment that it's in. So is it about the world that we're in, or is it about the mind? The answer is it's both. But it's even better when it's, it's just turned in on itself. Mm -hmm. So you have this game, you can play a game of chess, we can have some rules, and the rules of chess allow you to have a very beautiful, intricate, a game which for a thousand years still has, has entertained and infatuated humans. The game of maths, which has these basic rules like one plus one is two and so on, again, is an infinitely rich game. And if you just play it around the world of maths, you end up discovering truths that, that are true forever because they're logically consistent and it's a, it's a, it's a perfect game. What's play. the greatest so thing the, that so a the, let, let me just so, so the key thing here is that when you do something in maths and it's purely done in the mathematical realm, if you prove that it's true, it's true forever. My brother, who's also a mathematician, so I think some of it's got to do with innate abilities, not uh, training, because uh, out of very different things, the three of us have all ended up as mathematicians. He said, you know, we may do it uh, better than Newton, but we don't do it righter. Yeah. <laughs> when you say always right, uh, uh, well, uh, can you, is there some, uh, some, Thing that a mathematician discovered that is just so beautiful and so gigantic that it's like the super duper best story ever told. Well, I, I think one of the stories that I was told when I was a kid, which is the proof that there are infinitely many primes. Uh, I mean, primes, they're the atoms of mathematics. They're what we build all numbers from, the indivisible numbers like 5, 7, 17. Right. So all numbers, 105 is built by multiplying 3 times 5 times 7. So they're the most basic things. So, um, but how, how many are there of these numbers? We've got 2, 3, 5, 7, 11. But maybe they're just a finite number, like the periodic table has, I don't know what it is now, 118 atoms. Maybe there are finitely many primes which you can build all numbers from. Well, Euclid proved with just a beautiful little argument 2,000 years ago that there'll always be more and more primes however far you go up the universe of numbers. And he did it like this. Suppose you have a finite number of primes. Suppose there are a finite number of primes. He said, OK, well, take, suppose one of you says, oh, I don't believe you. I don't think you So here's a list of all the primes. So Euclid says, multiply all those primes together. And then here was his act of genius. He added one to that number. And then he says, OK, so this new number that I've just built you, um, what's that built out of? It must be built out of some of your primes. You say you've got all the primes. Well, if you try and divide by any of the primes on your list, you get remainder one because of the way this number was built. So there must be some primes missing from your list. You haven't got them all. So you say, OK, well, I'll just add those. Then Euclid <laughs> says, I'll play the same trick. I multiply all those together, add one, <laughs> and you've still missed some. You lose. And here's the beauty. You know, infinity, does it exist in the physical world? I don't know, probably not. But in the mathematical world, with this finite little argument that Euclid made, he's proved that you'll never, ever run out of these prime numbers. For me, that was a magical moment. And it, it's a proof which, as but, but, Silent but, 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 says, lasts forever. It's, a, it's, it's, it's a t eternal. Uh, physics... But what's, uh, it, but, but, uh, what's its essence? But no, hang on, no, 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 Robert, Robert, Robert. Have you heard that proof before? <laughs> Yes, I have. Okay. Now, when yeah. you heard it for the first time, did that not, didn't, did that it, not change? Yes, it, it, it didn't rock yes. your world. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, the, my first... rock is a smaller rock than your. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then coming back to the idea that, that G. H. Hardy said that you know, what, what the Greeks said about medicine, we laugh at. What the Greeks said about astronomy, we think it's a joke. But what the Greeks said about math, we still teach it today because that mathematical truth remains forever. And see, you but you're describing this, because uh, I asked you this way, I guess, you're saying, hooray for the mind of a Greek that could think that up, aren't we clever? But the... No, the, the no, 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 no. I think we tapped into a universal well, truth your, your about your implicit numbers. Question. My implicit question was, yeah. Did the numbers care? If, the, if, if you got number 3 trillion, 6,950, some prime way out there, that, that prime saying, I knew that. No, I but knew it's, that. Not, it's not about how so, clever... I don't know who these people it's are. Not about, I... It's not about how clever Euclid was. It's about how beautiful, in four lines of argument, 
you can gri- grapple with infinity. For, it, it wouldn't have matter whether it was Euclid, wouldn't matter whether it was anybody, wouldn't matter whether it was a pet cat that did it. It's the idea that, that, that's so precious. Might be called Garfield's theorem. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> but and I think it's what it, distinguishes it from the sciences. I mean, we're at a science festival, and I think it's important to distinguish that mathematics builds on the shoulders of giants. I mean, what that proof is true, and it'll be true forever. And in science, it's a much more evolutionary process. You propose uh, a model of the world, then you find it doesn't quite fit, and a new one comes over and knocks that one out. That doesn't happen in mathematics. Proofs gives us this certainty, and we, it allows us to, to, to really stand on the shoulders of giants and build something new. So when, when it, that's the charm of it. I know that the mathematical theorems that I've proved will last forever. It's a bit of immortality, and that's why I love this subject. But, but if, you were to, if you were to, I don't know how I asked this, if you were to become a number, um, are you there whether or not we're here? I mean, are you just there? <laughs> well, I, I, think, I think what you're asking is, uh, is about sort of, uh, are we Platonists at heart? And I think most yeah. mathematicians, are, I mean, I'd be interested to see, but I think most mathematicians feel, you know, uh, 317 is a prime number, not because the mind thinks it is, it's just a property of that number. And uh, I certainly feel there's a platonic reality out there called mathematics, uh, um, which is the, where I spend my time exploring this world. Um, and sometimes it says things about the real world that I live in, but frankly, I'm not interested in that. I'm more interested in just exploring this extraordinary world, uh, which I think has a reality of its own. And when you, say, of, and when you say that, is there is there is there a castle? Uh, is there like, is this is this a metaphysic which got like legs? I mean, is there like when you? Like, it has like, structure and pattern, oh. and, and it's, it's a bit like, more like, I think, uh, uh, I mean, uh, more like uh, the musical world, that it's got um, the same sort of texture as that. I was thinking more like a church, like maybe you are actually more religious than maybe you would like to admit. Maybe you think that there no, I succeeded are... Richard Dawkins as, uh, in Oxford, so I'm definitely... Oh. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you were going to say, oh, God, well, no. Oh, God, no, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but why not? Why, if you believe that numbers are out there, whether or not we're here, if you believe there is that logic that exists independent of all of us and all of us that ever I, will be... I and... believe numbers are out there, but I don't believe that's true of all mathematics. I mm. feel I'm mm. inventing most of the time. Mm. I believe Inventing stu- or discovering? I, believe, I, I, believe, I don't have any choice about yeah. discovering the numbers, and yeah. there are modern cognitive scientists making some neurological arguments mm. about that, but that's above my pay scale. But I don't think that to all mathematics that gets proved had to be invented. It could just have never been done. Yeah. So yeah. There, there, there's a link there with religion in terms of invention of ideas. And, so I won't go there. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it, it, it's... it's it, you know, it, these, are, these are concrete I, well, it, it's, I'm, I'm not the mathematician, so I, I, when I look at math, I, I look at it with a, with a purpose. Um, when you're looking at maths, you're looking at math because of, it, it's this game that you're playing. Um, it, it's, I think it's more than a game, though. I think that, you know, I, I think that always, I always resent it being compared to chess because it sort of um, makes it, you know, I think it's more important than that. Well, well can I, let me ask a different, let me ask it a different way. Uh, it, 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 does it matter if we know it's true or not? Like, like, is there some math that's just simply undis? Is there a proposition you can think of that is permanently and totally undecidable, and therefore whether we may not ever know it, but nevertheless it may have its existence well, independently? As is. soon as you formalise what you mean by decidable, the answer is yes. There are undecidable things. The well, thing, the things yeah. that are inarguably true and that cannot be proved. Really? And, and there are things where... This is a devastating discovery yeah. uh, made in the uh, 1930s by Kurt Gödel. Oh, well, I've heard of this. Yes. Yeah. They, devastating yeah. for... Made a lot of people very nervous, Devastating right? for philosophers, but largely ignored for yeah. 50 to 80 years But you years can change the rules and get around it in different yeah. ways. But exactly. I mean, so yeah. every math problem does not have an answer. No. Within a framework. That's, that's why I mentioned the idea of odd perfect numbers. We've grown up in a culture which says, if you can ask the question, and it's a well-formed question. We kind of expect it to have an answer, and probably a well-formed answer. And I believe there's no reason why, I'll tell you, there are no odd perfect numbers, and nobody will ever know why. Say that again? There are no odd perfect numbers. There's no odd number which is the sum of its proper divisors. Well, you ha- and you, nobody will ever know why. Yeah. So then how do you know it's true? I, I have an oracle. I'm telling you it's true. <laughs> he's, the ex- he's the world expert, so and we so all believe him. But that's religious, but, uh, isn't it? I mean, sort of? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> no, I, I think, you know, uh, Gödel proved that within first-order logic, which is a, uh, the logic that we use for doing things like number theory, uh, there'll be statements which are true, which will not be able to be proved within that system. 
Now, so you're, but so actually, we don't use first order logic mostly when we do mathematics. We use second order logic, third order. So, I mean, it, I think it's oversold this good theory. Theory. So, so you you'll say that's an undecidable question? No, no, what, no, no what, he's conjecturing. It's uh, okay. I'm conjecturing, but certainly what we've seen in the last few years are more and more natural language sounding versions of what are called girdle statements. So, the original girdle statements are kind of snakes uh, swallowing their own tails. So, uh, imagine imagine a, th a theorem that says if you have a proof of this theorem, you have a shorter proof of its negation. Yeah. Well, you start working through it. Could they have a proof of it? I don't know. Well, if you did, <laughs> <laughs> if you did, you'd have a shorter proof of its negation, and at least according to standard uh, Aristotelian logic, you'd have proved something and not something, and all rules would be gone. You could prove anything. So, if mathematics is consistent, which we tend to hope it is. There, if I could show you that, that statement, if I could prove that statement, well, I can't prove that statement, but I could show it's true. And this is what Gödel and people after him did. But now we've even got so-called Gödel statements, which seem to be saying fairly natural things about measurables of physical systems. So are, are unprovable. Are undecidable. Undecidable. And we know wow. one, of, one of the very famous things that Paul Cohen won a Fields Medal mm -hmm. for um, many, many years, 50 years ago was, uh, what's called the continuum hypothesis, and it doesn't matter precisely what it is, but it asks whether there's a set, essentially, is there a set bigger than the natural numbers and smaller than the real numbers? Mm -hmm. And it's now been shown to be independent of the normal rules that mathematicians How are willing to accept. How is this different from is God three in one or just one? How's, what's the difference? Well, the, that doesn't bother me. It bothered Augustine. So that's the yeah. difference? <laughs> and no, no, what the difference is. I don't know. I, I, I tell you what the, the difference is, yeah. and this is really important, is you haven't defined your terms. And in mathematics, yeah. we're very good at defining our terms, our axioms, and how you can deduce one thing from another. But you've just introduced something, God, which uh, you, you, know, you, you haven't defined, so we can't stu start to I talk can't about prove it, it, I can't not prove it. It's well, a kind of a girdle like well, kind of being. Girdle went to his death, among other things in his notes, is an attempt to logically prove the existence of God. Girdle didn't really believe. Yeah. what he'd done. He felt that meant mathematics wasn't properly fitted together. Well, let's talk about you guys. What do you do? What, what do you, <laughs> when you go to work, uh, do you, like, sit in the chair? Or... <laughs> like, you're not like other dads. You don't go to the office, I wouldn't think. Or you do, but maybe you don't, like, do work-like behaviors. So maybe ask it a different way. Do you do this alone, your work? <laughs> <laughs> Have we been recorded? Or what? <laughs> <laughs> I'm, not, I'm getting into the anthropology no, no. of it now. No, it, it is the Mathematicians case. Mathematicians at work is my new subject. No, it, How do uh, you do it? A very famous mathematician once actually characterized mathematics as something that you lay down, close your eyes, and work like hell. <laughs> and if you can say that and mean it, then you're a mathematician. <laughs> and this, of course, means you're doing it by yourself. Actually, oh, it's more fun. a lot of mathematics, <laughs> <laughs> historically, it was done largely by people on their own. And very often it is, but these days it's increasingly becoming a team game. It is. Yeah. There's a lovely website uh, just started in the couple, last couple of years called Polymath, mm -hmm. where uh, I forgot the name of the Fields Medalist. Tim Gowers. Tim Gowers, Tim it came from. Yeah. So he, he, he throws out this problem on a blog. Mm -hmm. And he just says to everybody in the math community or any other community, if you can contribute to trying to solve this problem, add a comment. And and they've solved at least one quite significant problem by just people throwing in ideas and bouncing off each other. And that's almost the, the, the opposite extreme of this idea of the lone genius. Well, uh, the but I still think, you know, you, you, your, your book about uh, Andrew Wiles proving Fermat's last theorem, that was such a prize that he, he didn't talk to anybody else because yeah. he wanted to be one, the one to prove it. And, uh, yeah, it's yeah. It's so I mean, Andrew Wiles is, is an extreme case of somebody who... Uh, so he was a problem 350 years old. And this Andrew is Wiles, Fermat's last theorem. That's right. So he... he 350 years, so the, the, the more that people failed to prove it, the more it became desirable. And, and when Andrew Wiles was based in, in Princeton by that time, um, once he realized the technique that might get him there, he closed shop. He largely worked at home, didn't go to the department very much. Because he was scared that if he whispered his process to someone else, they'd steal it from him? I think, I think it was different. Partly it was fear of, of being beaten to the prize. Right. Two, the fear of being thought to be crazy. Because if, if, if no one else has done it for 350 years, why does he think he's so smart? 
Mm -hmm. And also just the intense focus that's required to take on such a major problem. And, and for seven years, he, he did nothing but work on this problem. But on the other, it, 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 roughly the same time, you have somebody like Paul Erdish, who is an extraordinary, has a wonderful book called The Man Who Loved Only Numbers. It's very, very much worth reading. This is reading. the fellow who would ring your doorbell and say, yeah. mm -hmm. I'm op open your mind, I'm here for My business. My mind is That's open. It. Yeah. And he, he collaborated with 500 mathematicians during his career, published over 1,500 papers, and... Uh, he was the Willie Loman of math, that he would just show up as the salesman, go ding dong, and he'd then spend two weeks with you and you'd have to give him yeah. breakfast. Yeah, he, he, he was here once with uh, Ron Graham on the East Coast, and they'd got up early, and all he had was two suitcases, that was his entire world possessions, and he, uh, he was with Ron Graham, and, and he said, uh, oh, we're stuck, you know, we, we don't know what to do. And Ron Graham said, it's okay, I know a guy on the West Coast who can solve this problem. And uh, just said, well, let's ring him now. And Ron Graham said, look, it's 8 a.m. in the morning, and in, in California it'll be 5 a.m. And Erdrich said, well, that's great. That means he'll be in. <laughs> <laughs> For him, it was purely mathematics. That it was, that's what the whole world revolved around. And, and, and which is the more common way to do it? By yourself or uh, on the phone or online or uh, ringing I, the doorbell? I think, or? I think more and more mm -hmm. it's uncommon to be entirely alone. Yeah. Uncommon. Uncommon. But I think it's a combination. I mean, it's, I, I find what I do best is to, to work on my own, then go and share ideas, bounce, and you get much further, and you come back, and you need to spend... And I think there's some... some you all go to round. conferences, right? That's we go to conferences, we uh, go and v visit each other. We, uh, I find maths quite difficult to do online, because uh, uh, by email, because actually I think there's a lot of unspoken... Uh, sort of uh, trying to verbalize an idea in your head, you haven't got, quite got the language. There's a lot of, with the, my collaborators, uh, of, of the kind of, uh, and, and I can't do that by email. Uh, and, and somehow my collaborator, yeah, I, I think I see what you're seeing, and, and then we can start to formulate it. But, I, I would but we think... do quite a lot of that with Skype or, or Skype Plus. Oh, right. Yeah, and absolutely, and it's really a matter of how good the broadband is. But if you have a problem, <laughs> if you have a problem that's, you know, 13 pages in the figuring, and you have this fragile sort of thought in your head, and it's got all these attenuating numbers. Mm -hmm. So you go, oh my God. And then you're sitting at a bar with someone, and he's got his problem, which is 30 pages long. I don't quite understand how that conversation begins, because I, there's a tension here. I don't want to hear about your confusions. I've got my own. Well, I, so, had a, I have a, a good friend who's a category theorist, which uh, is not my brand of mathematics. In fact, the comment I was going to make is, Mathematics in many ways is a single subject, but in other ways I often have much more in common with certain parts of physics or engineering than I have with other parts of mathematics because of the way I approach my subject. And if I don't happen to speak the given subsubject, just haven't been taught enough, it's just as alien as if somebody's speaking Russian and I'm trying to speak Italian. But I had a friend who was a category theorist and his first wife left after uh, 10 years of hearing all the category theory anyone could hear in 10 years. It didn't matter that she didn't have any, he still wanted the audience. And a lot of mathematicians have that experience that in the, in the need to articulate, it, some, it really doesn't matter often if you're getting answers because you've had to say it so much it. more clearly. Do you guys have pencils or chalk? <laughs> Apparently we don't have wives, uh, but... Let's just give it the pencils and chalk. Do you, do you work with a pen? Do you write something down? Or yeah, you, yeah. Or just, okay. yeah, you're trying out no, sort of... Uh, do you all have computers? Mm -hmm. No, computers uh, are not something that I... Uh, oh, is computers like unkosher? In this? No, no, I... No, no, it depends on your sort of end. mathematics, I think. I mean, I'm at the other end. I'm, I'm yeah. a, a real uh, passion for using the computer as a, as a colleague. So I'd be firing thousands of questions, and I... And the next thing I'm going to is a conference on symbolic and numeric computing, uh, mainly to try and make the point that I think we've largely restricted what we use the computer for because of the way we were trained and the way computers used to be. But any piece of math that I'm shown, I can usually make more progress at a computer than without it. And part of it's because I can Google. Because you, you can know, Google? I can Google. I mean, there's an enormous amount. Google you, what? Well, Google the math literature. Pull out a paper from oh. 1940 if I know how to do it. But, um, but I think there's this kind of misconception that the computer has kind of put the mathematician out of business because, of course, it can do arithmetic much faster than I can. But, um, but actually, if you're trying to explore, you know, these infinitely many prime numbers, well, a computer isn't much help because it's a finite beast and it, it can't have the same sort of uh, thought processes yet as I do. So I don't find it a very, you know, it can find an, another big prime number, but that's not very helpful in trying to understand the pattern that underlies all of these prime numbers. I think, so, I think all, all your questions about, you know, do people work alone, do they use computers? Do they, it, it, mathematicians are no different than anybody else at, at this World Science Festival, except in the group we have here, in their extreme purity, in the absolute 
abstractness and pointlessness of, of what is done. And yet, <laughs> and yet every, not just every so often, relentlessly, something pops up that has a major application back in the real world. Uh, whether you know, Encryption is an example where prime numbers are fundamental, and yet you, prime, you, fund, you study prime numbers for the hell of it. Um, Fermat's little theorem, again, applicable to, to, to cryptography, but invented by a pure mathematician 350 years ago. The tools, the community, everything is the same, except the utterly, utterly... If you think string theory is abstract, you should think about the mathematics that underpins it, which is... I, 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 one last computer question. Do, do you know what the computer... If, the, if you ask the computer, so how much is blah, 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 and it goes, ping, and gives you an answer, do you know how it reached that answer? Sometimes the answer is yes, in principle. Sometimes the answer is no, but ideally what you have is a certificate. You can have an answer that comes out and it says, and if you don't believe me, check this. That's an ideal sort of answer where you don't know how it found it, but there are many cases in which checking an answer once you're told it is much easier than finding it. Really? And, yes, and those are the kind of cases where, <laughs> where, the, where you feel like you've won, because not only did you get an answer you couldn't find, but you get an easy way to check it. Well, let me ask about Gregoire Perlman, Keith. Uh -huh. um, yeah. This is a very weird man. His problem is something called the Poincaré conjecture. What is that? Okay. And who is he, who is Grégoire? So, Grégoire Perlman. Oh, oh, yeah. he's, yes. Yeah. He's, right. he's a very unusual case. We're going to be end up, we're going to be talking about a very atypical case, although a very famous one. But the Poincaré conjecture goes back to the beginning of the 20th century, Henry Poincaré. And one way to think about it was the. Think of the following question. You go back to, to ancient Greece, and the Greeks lived on what seemed like a flat earth, but by using mathematics, they were able to figure out that the world was in fact spherical, and they even calculated the diameter with great accuracy. So using mathematics, you can step out of the world you live in and see what it must look like. We didn't look at the, we didn't actually see that image of the world. We didn't know with our eyes that it was spherical until NASA sent spacecraft up and we took photographs. Right. But the Greeks had figured it out by using mathematics. Could we, as creatures now living in a three-dimensional world, could we understand the shape of the universe we live in by using mathematics so, as it were, step outside the universe? For example, the universe may be like the inside of a sphere and that you could move around freely, or maybe it's like the inside of a big inner tube that you can keep going round and round, or something more complicated like a pretzel. So there are lots of shapes the universe might be. Could we figure it out using mathematics Poincaré came up with a method that can be understood in those terms. And here's what Poincaré did. We've actually got a little video we can show about Why this one. Why is it called the conjecture? Because oh, it's on it, it, Perelman actually was the one no, that proved this, true. 2002. So if we can roll that tape, let's okay. imagine we want to understand the shape of the universe is in. So we're going to get in a spacecraft and we're going to go out and we're going to start splaying out a rope behind us. We're going to go all around the universe on this tour and we're eventually going to come back again and create a big loop that will track the path that we've followed. So here we go round and round. It's a big world. It's going to take us a while to get round. But we're going to come back. And when we come back, we're going to be able to find the tail that we left behind, the end of that rope. And then we're going to start to pull the rope tight. And when we start to pull it tight, one of two things can happen. You start tugging. Oh, it stopped. Maybe you're in the inside of an inner tube and you can't pull it any tighter. Or the following might happen. You pull it and pull it and pull it, and it pulls down. So those are the two possible ways it could come about. If you can't pull it together, you know that the universe is not like the inside of a sphere. It be, it's more like an inner tube or something like that. If you could always, if you did this infinitely many times, if you could always pull it together, the Poincaré conjecture says, then you will be able to conclude that you are indeed on the inside of a sphere, a three-sphere. If you can always do that. This is not practical in the way that the Greeks were, <laughs> but it does say that with mathematics, there is no limit to the ability of what we can find out. With mathematics, in principle, we can find out the shape of the universe we live in without stepping outside of that universe. We can look through the eyes of God, if you like, at our universe using mathematics. And Perelman proved that in 2002, although it took seven or eight years before the rest of the mathematical he proved community. It. Which, which, which one did he prove? Which that that prove? was the, that you can in fact find the shape of the universe <laughs> by going up one thing. Uh -huh. If that, if you can now always pull it together. He's a very strange guy, though, because he wins oh. a prize and then he doesn't. He show didn't up. want the million dollar prize. He, he didn't, didn't want, want the, the million. Didn't dollar. want the Fields Medal. He's a very unusual guy. 
I've never met him. Very few mathematicians have because he's very reclusive. Uh, that made it a great news story. On the other hand, the mathematical discovery itself was the front page story on Science Magazine, the, the mathematical discovery of the year. It was the science discovery of the year. The yeah. science discovery of the year, yeah. But I, I'm not so sure it's so atypical. No, I don't think it's so atypical. <laughs> because, <laughs> so, so... What's not so atypical? So, so here's behavior. a guy parallel. His he, behavior, yeah. So he, 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 this is one of the seven great problems in maths. In, in the year 2000, the Clay Foundation said, these are the seven great problems for the new millennium that mathematicians should, should think about. And the Poincaré conjecture was one of them, and it's been the first one to be improved by Perelman. There's a million dollars for it. And they rang up Perelman and they said, here, do you want the million dollars? He said, no, I don't do the, the, the math for the money. So then they offered him the Fields Medal, which is the, the math equivalent of a Nobel Prize, even better than a Nobel Prize, because you only get it every four years. And they invited him to Madrid to collect it at the International Congress of Mathematicians, and he didn't turn up. And they rang him up and they said, look, why didn't you come and get the Fields Medal? He said, I live in Russia, it would have taken me a day to fly to Madrid, a day to collect the prize, a day to do the interviews, a day to fly back to Russia. That's four days wasted when I could have been doing maths. <laughs> uh, this is th an, an, an air dish. Again, air dish is exactly so I mean, the same. I think, I think that's a very charitable description of uh, Perelman. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> you know, you know, by all accounts, he's a little more strange yeah. than that. Now, can, I, can I ask, a, this is a delicate question, and then <laughs> I'm going to do something. This, this conference, is, this is, Festival doesn't usually let questions come from can, the so audience. Can I just, can I, I'm really curious about this. Because I, very few people have met him, and, and, yeah. and he is an old chap. But see, I would say that he, that, that this absolute purity and dedication, like Erdish. Erdish won the Wolf Prize, £50,000, but £50,000 was worth a lot. And he didn't buy a house. He never, he never had a house in his entire life. Instead, he offered the money as prizes for other people to solve I, other math problems. Like uh, most of you don't know Perlman, but I, I knew Erdos quite well. I mm. first met him when I was oh. one. And but I, when I, you were what? When I was one. You remember it, was, it clearly? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I, no, 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 I'll I, tell you the strange thing about Perlman, though, is yeah. that he stopped doing mathematics. Yeah, that's yeah. where it's going to That's a strange that's, thing. That yeah. is. You know, that is a typical. Totally Why, when you, can I suggest that there may be just a hint of Mr. Asperger in the oh, room? Uh, oh. There's a lovely recent book. I think it's called Perfect Rigor. Perfect Rigor, yeah. And it is a quintessential description of a high-achieving ultra Asperger and a very, very interesting description of the sociology of how math kids going to the Olympiad were yeah. being trained in a, in a time in which there was tremendous anti-Semitism. So two places in the elite university system for Jews. A third if you got a gold medal on the Olympiad team. Yeah. Huh. But the, the reason I said it was atypical was I know thousands of mathematicians and hardly any of them are like that. They're regular people, yeah. men, you know, women. I, 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 would, I would hate to, to, to think that yeah. as a journalist who meets lots of mathematicians, lovely people, lots of very well-rounded. Well, you go for the good story. Well but but, but <laughs> what, I'm saying, what I'm trying to say is that Two of the greatest discoveries, two of the greatest mathematicians of, 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 our, of, of your time, your generation, have utterly, utterly bizarre attitudes to the way they live their lives. And in, in science, in physics, in cosmology, there are people that are dedicated and obsessed, but not to that extreme. So we're looking at the very long end of the tail, but it's a tail that doesn't exist even in other abstract and pure pursuits. But wasn't Newton, uh, you in the first row, Mr. Newton fan, but wasn't Newton one of these guys who would just kind of walk around and get so lost in thought, he would draw things on the path, no one, no one seemed to understand anything he was saying. He was an odd duck also, right? Yeah. A Fr friend so, of mine, Robin Wintz, told a story of, about Norbert Wiener the other day. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know if it's true, but the Wiener family had just moved house. And, and uh, so he was in his new house, and he went off to the office, and they said, look, Norbert, remember where we live, remember you've moved house. <laughs> so he went off to work, came back, and, and went back to his old house, <laughs> and was sat on the doorstep, really depressed, didn't know, what he, you know, didn't know where to go, and this little girl came up to him, he said, hey, little girl, uh, do you know where the Wiener family live? And she said, yes, Daddy, it's just over here. <laughs> and it's, uh, <laughs> so, All right, on uh, that note, I'm going to ask, if you guys want to ask questions of the panel, let's see. Oh, well, we only have five minutes. Well, what the hell? Um, <laughs> The night is young. Yeah. Yes, the night is young. Let's just do that. Now, I don't know whether they're going to turn up the lights because this is illegal. We're not supposed to let you ask questions, but what? They'll have to shout them. So, yes, you'll have to shout them. But you're in the front row. Go ahead. Um, and I'll repeat them. I, I heard that just like uh, uh, an athlete, uh, uh, you, you reach a peak at age 27. Is that? The question is, is athletes sometimes reach their peak very young, say 27. <laughs> depends on the sport. What about, what about peak math years? 
No, that's right. false. <laughs> there's, 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 there's a, there was a great article in the New York uh, weekend section a few years ago called uh, Young Geniuses and Old Masters. Not about mathematics, but about art. And saying, don't try and compare Picasso to Titian. So I think it's absolutely true mm. that, that uh, radical ideas tend to be the, the work of younger mathematicians. And maybe if you've not done anything earth-shaking by the age of 35, it's unlikely you're going to do something fantastic later. But uh, there's a recent book by uh, Ruben Hirsch called Loving and Hating Mathematics. And one of the, uh, the cl uh, cliches that he tries to break down is just that. So I think, like in any other subject, uh, you don't do the same things at 60 that you did at 20. Or if you do, it's probably been wasted. Uh, I don't know very many really creative mathematicians who say, oh, I'm 35, it's time to stop. Did Erdish, when he rang the bell and he was like 60 and he was ringing the bell of a 24-year-old, did the 24-year-old go, oh, God, the old guy? Or did the guy go, oh, I'm so glad to see him? One night, uh, my mother called me. When was, you were two? No, I was, I was, <laughs> <laughs> you can picture this. I was 29 and I was actually naked in the dark in bed in Halvax and I thought only one person would call at this time of the night. I picked up phones with my mother and she said, somebody would like to speak to you. And a little voice got on the phone and said, hello, this is Paul. Do you know the question with 29 points in the plane? And it was Erdos just continuing a discussion we'd had several years earlier. Actually, he'd had, <laughs> he'd, he'd had it with my brother. I realized after a while that I thought I didn't need to dis disabuse him about that. But no, he was completely egalitarian. His mind was open. Uh, he wasn't a mathematician of the same uh, status as the greatest mathematicians of the 20th century, but he was maybe one of the most influential because he went everywhere. And if I was getting a little grouchy about comparing him to Perelman, uh, he was an odd man. Uh, Erdős. Erdős. Yeah. But he was odd in idiosyncratic, gentle yeah. ways. And uh, he didn't have many needs. And that's largely because people like Ron Graham yeah. look after him. But, but I would say not at all odd in that he found the thing he loved, right. which was doing math. And if you, if you love that math, maths that much, then any other behavior would have been odd. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that, yeah. that's the way I kind of... So it's like I, Mark I think the other... swimming. He was in the pool all the yeah. time because yeah. he just loved being yeah. in the yeah. pool. Yeah, yeah the people that you read about, the ones that produce the pinnacle results, by definition, they are unusual and not often manifest well, itself but, in other ways. You know. but I think but the other wait, thing... Wait, wait, let's ask, let them ask one more. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, that waving person, yeah, you. <laughs> What if I was good at the beginning and then I wasn't good enough and now I'm still really interested? Do I still have a prayer? Do I still? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Except that I wasn't really that good. Yeah, I think there's always a, a, a chance to restart the game. It's such a logical subject. You just have to take yourself back to the point where you, know, you understand and, and start again, going down the path that uh, mathematicians have laid out for you. So I think if you've got determination, and this is why you know, people carry on doing mathematics however old they are, because they've got a passion for wanting to know the answer. Provided you've got that passion, it doesn't matter when, what, old, what age you were when you started. If you want to know what the next step is, you'll be able to get there. This is one of the things that seems to be determined about genius in general forms is, you see it with Newton and others too, the capacity to actually not leave your desk for 24 hours, independent of the subject. I was going to say that I think the answer is a little like, I wish I'd learnt another language when I was six. Mm -hmm. It's a lot easier when you're six than yeah. when you're 36. So the chances that you will learn it with the fluency that you would have learnt it if you hadn't had the interruption are zero, but, but the chance that you can learn it to do it well enough for it to be a source of great pleasure and accomplishment that's a matter of perseverance. A good starting point is Martin Gardner's books uh, and recreational maths, and that's a good way just to get, get into the swing of things and just to learn some of the curious math that's around. Yeah. And it's getting easier because of the internet and yeah, the accessibility, yeah. There's the Wikipedia resources. Actually, Wikipedia in mathematical areas is really pretty darn good. The higher up, it gets very reliable. The materials, and I, every week or so, because you know, I go on NPR as the math guy, I get emails from people with that very same question. You can reach people. And we're not going to give an hour's time in the response, but we'll say, try this book or try to talk to this person at your nearest university. It's actually relatively easy now. You know, 
If you're a mathematician, you actually, your heart lifts if someone says, I'd like to get back into mathematics, and we usually spend a few help. minutes trying to help them out. We, we have so few friends, you can call them we need everyone we can get. <laughs> uh, two more, and then we'll, uh, yes, over there. Yes, you. The question is, if you read a science textbook, it seems like it's storytelling, and you can get involved, and you get interested, and you want to know how it's going to turn out. You read a math textbook, and you go into it, and they make assumptions, and you can't remember whether you made those same assumptions, and suddenly you are brought to the end, yeah, and there's the answer, it's all too The comparison there would be like reading a, a cookery book or an automobile repair manual. All four of us have written books about mathematics which tell the story. That's why we're on the stage, of course. <laughs> yeah. No, but, but I, I think even the proofs that you find yeah. in, in books, yeah. you know, uh, Fermat's proof that uh, every prime uh, which has remained a one when you divide it by four can be written as two squares is a fantastic story. And how you get from, you know, something like 41 to 16 plus 25, and whatever the prime is, if it's got remained a one on division by four, you can always write it as two squares. It's an extraordinary story. And I, want, I don't want to just know the answer. I want to know how did this, uh, this hero get from here to here. See, that's my suspicion. That the answer to your question is some people, like I once went to breakfast with uh, my boss, Larry Tish at CBS, and he brought H. Ross Perot, who was then just a, a tycoon. And they, they sat around and they, they put, opened up the Wall Street Journal, it was at a breakfast table at the Drake Hotel, and they, they looked at these just sheets of numbers and they would point and they giggle and they gave little. <laughs> and like, I guess we're going to make them Do this guy like so. Numbers? No, I, I, but I thought to myself, wow, these people read numbers the way I would read Aesop. You know, it's just, they just are different. Maybe. I, I think you're, yeah, she, she can't make the step. I, I think you're identifying a real problem that Marcus uh, uh, mentioned early on, which is that mathematical is a mass, mathematics is a very large scaffold and, and hierarchical, and it's hard to learn something before another thing. And so we've tended, in writing textbooks, to look for very efficient, very focused proofs, and kind of trust that the reader knows why they want to be there. And that's not always a particularly good solution. The alternative, and, and uh, a, a mathematician called Moore uh, in Texas tried to do the opposite with great students, which is to motivate every step, prove nothing, get the students to prove everything for themselves. And in theory, it was a fantastic idea. In practice, it meant that by the end of a four-year degree, you were in semester two. <laughs> Last and so question that's the, of the trade-off. The evening. Uh, <clears throat> See, I, I hate to do the people one in the front. Some, but yeah, one person can, over, oh no. Is there somebody in the back? Yes, way in the back, that's naked arm up there, yeah. <laughs> um, I want to go kind of back to Kurt, go, Kurt, go, go, Kurt Gerdell, yeah. Um, I wonder if you see his theorems as like a constraint on you, or rather like a new opportunity to find maybe non-axiomatic math. Did, you, did everyone hear that? The, the question is, is because of Goodell's this uncertainty that he introduces. Oh boy, am I oh. going to have trouble? Did you say non-axiomatic yeah. maths? Yeah. yeah. Uh, I mean, I, I, <laughs> it's almost one of these things. That you, what is mathematics? Because you can define mathematics, and for many years it was as the stuff that follows from the axioms. But most of what mathematicians that are living today do is actually non-axiomatic. It's just exploring things in an analytic way, thinking rationally. It's not based on those axioms. There's this sort of pure axiomatic mathematics that sort of has a history. So it's more Kit weeks. Carson. Uh, but if you just actually say, of all the people who earn money by doing mathematics, hardly any of them do axiomatic mathematics. They deal with problems that arise in the real world or within mathematics, but not in an axiomatic framework. So that was, was he an lonesome for axiomatic mathematics, or was he... Uh, dis in a sense, Gödel proved that it was a... Pointless trying to do that because oh. it wasn't going to capture everything. Have we, saw, have we answered your question? <laughs> yes, thank you. Yeah. You're welcome. Good. And thank everybody for coming. Yeah. <laughs> 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 right.